Lord Jesus, the day when we see your face and we love you perfectly will be a good day. In the meantime, we love you imperfectly. Oh, we love to love you. We long to love you. We would say our love is small. Help our love. You have done everything required to bring us to yourself, to cancel our debt, to give us eternal life, to allow us to know you. And we pray in the ways that you would provide for us today that we would surrender to you, submit up under your word, and love you all over again. We ask it in your name. Amen. You may be seated. You can turn in your Bibles this morning to Revelation chapter 2, and we're going to parachute in this morning to the book of Revelation for our last installment of our Philosophy of Ministry series. All of these are available on the website, and, and you can walk back through them. The purpose of this series has been to help you understand a behind-the-scenes framework for Grace Bible Church. What is our DNA? What is it that makes us tick? What do we love? Uh, what is it that does, uh, shapes and, and defines our programming and the ways we interact with one another? And this last installment is just critical to who we are as a church. In addition to preaching the word, shepherding the flock, equipping the saints, growing the church, making disciples, following the script, identifying error, preaching the gospel, embracing God's foolishness, accurately handling the word, prioritizing people, developing leaders, and disciplining the wayward. We are to love the Savior. That is to be a defining mark of any church. And we're going to drop in this morning to Revelation 2, where we see Jesus himself indicting the church at Ephesus for its failure to love the Savior. December 14th, 1990 was a big day. The state of California would issue me a license to operate motor vehicles on public streets if I passed the driver's test. Every movement would be evaluated, every turn would be scrutinized, every procedure had to be precisely executed. And it wasn't the examiner of the state of California that I feared most, he was not the hurdle. The hurdle to getting my driver's license was my dad. He treated my driver's test like a fighter pilot's check ride. And the 1987 Ford Aerostar minivan had one of those newfangled digital speedometers. So coasting down the hill in Highland, California towards the DMV, that digital speedometer indicated that I had gone one mile an hour over the posted speed limit. My dad just simply said, fail. <laughs> Turn it around. And we drove back home. The lump in my throat growing, moisture in my eyes appearing. And I went to my room and I got to sit there for about an hour. Thinking about what the number 3-5 meant exactly. I didn't get to be a driver if I didn't pass the evaluation. That was the bottom line. My dad wanted me to pass the California's evaluation, but I had to pass his first. This thought of being evaluated takes us back to the first century and to another evaluation, a detailed scrutiny of churches. Seven churches were scrutinized by the Lord Jesus Christ in the first century, seven churches in Asia Minor, which is the modern-day state of Turkey. What would it be like to be scrutinized by the Lord for the life and health of your church? To get something of a spiritual audit by the one who sees hearts, by the one who knows everything. What would it be like to have Jesus, the Lord, come into our church and give us personal spiritual evaluation of our condition. We have an opportunity and a privilege to look in on Jesus' evaluation of a first century church and to use it 
as a test case for our own hearts, for our own lives. The letter to the church at Ephesus, I believe, is probably most appropriate to a church like Grace Bible Church. Will you read with me Revelation chapter 2, the first seven verses? To the angel of the church in Ephesus write, The one who holds the seven stars in his right hand, the one who walks among the seven golden lampstands, says this, I know your deeds and your toil and perseverance, that you cannot tolerate evil men, and you put to the test those who call themselves apostles, and they are not, and you found them to be false. And you have perseverance, and you have endured for my name's sake, and have not grown weary. But I have this against you, that you have left your first love. Therefore, remember from where you have fallen, and repent, and do the deeds you did at first, or else I am coming to you and will remove your lampstand out of its place, unless you repent." Yet this you do have, that you hate the deeds of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To him who overcomes, I will grant to eat of the tree of life, which is in the paradise of God. At Ephesus, we have the opportunity to see the life of a local church over a couple of generations. It's important to put ourselves in the shoes of a Christian in the church at Ephesus to think through Jesus' personal assessment of that church. And we know a little bit about the church at Ephesus. We know the church of Ephesus from the book of Acts, from the book of Ephesians, from 1 Timothy, from 2 Timothy, and from the book of Revelation. The church at Ephesus had prominent founding members, and there were prominent pastors at this church. It, it in fact, had a remarkable pedigree of leadership and instruction. Priscilla and Aquila were there, that husband and wife team who had given their lives to making the gospel known in every city they went to. Apollos was there, who was mighty in the scriptures, leading many to faith in Jesus. Paul the Apostle was there on his third missionary journey, 53 to 57 AD, probably stayed three years. Timothy, of course, was a pastor there. Paul wrote the letter to 1 Timothy uh, or the first letter to Timothy in AD 65 and the second probably in 67, 68 AD. And it is likely that the apostle John was there as a pastor uh, in 66 AD and likely there for some time. We discover the birth of the church at Ephesus in Acts 19 and 20. They were birthed under persecution. There was opposition from people like the seven sons of Sceva. There was Demetrius the silversmith who tried to bring harm to the gospel proclamation there. And we have in the book of Ephesians, the church at Ephesus being established in sound doctrine, those first three chapters, establishing them in the truth of the gospel and, and sound words about God. In Ephesians chapter 4, verse 14, we have this command as a result, we are no longer to be children, tossed here and there by waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by the trickery of men, by craftiness and deceitful scheming. In other words, the church at Ephesus was warned to have discernment about error. In Ephesians 4.17, they were encouraged this way, this I say to you and affirm together with the Lord that you walk no longer as the Gentiles walk in the futility of their minds. The church was to be different than the world around them. In Ephesians chapter 5, 6 to 11, there are warnings there against compromise and exposure and conformity to the surrounding world. It's interesting, in Acts 20, Paul, in fact, warns the leadership at Ephesus that people would come up from amongst the leadership, from amongst the elders at the church, and lead people astray. And its very beginnings, there were apostolic warnings about false teaching in the church. Of course, in 1 Timothy and 2 Timothy, those letters to Timothy are replete with warnings about false teachings and the dangers of false doctrine and uh, corrections again and again about how to deal with those who teach things that aren't true. And then you have Revelation chapter 2 in this letter from Jesus. It's hard to think of a church with a richer history or a greater depth of instruction or a stronger lineup of pastoral leadership than the church at Ephesus. 
So how did they do? How did they fare under Jesus' evaluation? We're going to look at Jesus' evaluation of the church at Ephesus in six elements. We'll see a salutation, a commendation, a confrontation, a command, a plea, and a promise. Let's look first at the salutation. This is the opening greeting, the opening statement of a letter. It's like saying, dear grandma, or to whom it may concern. The salutation are these opening words in verse 1. And the letter starts this way, to the angel of the church in Ephesus, write. Uh, Ephesus was a, a really remarkable city. It had become the center of evangelism in Asia by the time this letter was written. Uh, Revelation 2 comes some 35 years after the Apostle Paul wrote Ephesians. It's the first city you would come to in Asia. All Roman officials were required by law to stop at Ephesus first. The capital of the region was Pergamum, but the government actually set up its seat in Ephesus. It was the center of commerce and games. They had a 25,000-seat stadium. It was a wealthy seaport and was considered the marketplace of Asia. It was the center of worship of Artemis or Diana, where cult prostitution and idolatry were practiced. In fact, the Temple of Diana, which has been recreated in downtown Nashville, was a wonder of the ancient world, 425 by 220 feet and 60 feet high. It had 127 marble pillars, 36 of which were covered with gold and encrusted with jewels. It had thousands of priests and priestesses whose worship was the engagement of temple prostitution. Inside the temple of Diana was an inviolable inner sanctum. It was a living tree, and it was a refuge and asylum for unrepentant criminals. If you were running from the law, and you could make it to Ephesus, and you could make it to Diana's temple, and you could make it to that inner sanctum, you would be safe, free from prosecution. Uh, no government officials or authorities could go in there and extradite you. There were also two temples in the city dedicated to the imperial cult where the emperor of Rome was worshipped as God. And we read in this salutation, the one who holds the seven stars in his right hand. This is a reflection back to Revelation chapter 1, where John received the vision of Jesus. Turn your attention to uh, Revelation 1.9. I, John, your brother and fellow partaker in the tribulation and kingdom and perseverance which are in Jesus, I was on the island called Patmos because of the word of God and the testimony of Jesus. This is like the Alcatraz of the ancient world. John was imprisoned there on a, a rock island prison because of his testimony of Christ. Verse 10, I was in the spirit on the Lord's day and I heard behind me a loud voice like the sound of a trumpet saying, write in a book what you see and send it to the seven churches, to Ephesus, to Smyrna, to Pergamum, Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia, and to Laodicea. Then I turned to see the voice that was speaking with me. Having turned, I saw seven golden lampstands. And in the middle of the lampstands, I saw one like a son of man, clothed in a robe, reaching to the feet, girded across his chest with a golden sash. His head and his hair were white, like white wool, like snow. And his eyes were like a flame of fire. His feet were like burnished bronze when it has been made to glow in a furnace. And his voice was like the sound of many waters. In his right hand, he held seven stars. And out of his mouth came a sharp two-edged sword. And his face was like the sun shining in its strength. And when I saw him, I fell at his feet like a dead man. This is John the Apostle. And the last, one of the last times he saw Jesus, he was reclining against him closely at the Last Supper. And here, seeing Jesus uncloaked, revealed in all of his radiating glory, he falls at his feet like a dead man. And Jesus placed his right hand on me, saying, Do not be afraid. I am the first and the last. I am the living one. I was dead, and behold, I am alive forevermore, and I have the keys of death and Hades. Therefore, write. What is appealed to in the salutation in chapter 2, this one who holds the seven stars in his right hand, who walks among the seven golden lampstands. 
uh, is a reflection back to this vision in chapter 1. As Jesus addresses the seven churches, he begins each letter with a salutation identifying himself with some aspect of that vision. And here, he is the one who holds the seven stars in his right hand. He is the one who walks among the seven golden lampstands. Verse 20 tells us the stars are the angels of the seven churches, and the lampstands are the churches. This depicts Christ's possession of the church, his sovereign care, his presence among the churches. He inspects them. He walks among them, knowing what takes place in his churches. And it depicts Christ's ability to remove the lampstands. Jesus is present, sovereign, and concerned in and among his churches. And Jesus is the light that the lampstands are to display. That's the salutation of the letter. We come in verse 2 to the commendation. That is, Jesus explaining to the church at Ephesus, here's what you've been doing well. Here's what you're doing right. And we find this in verses 2 and 3 and 6. Jesus says, I know your deeds and your toil and your perseverance, that you cannot tolerate evil men, and you put to the test those who call themselves apostles, and they are not. You found them to be false, and you have perseverance and have endured for my name's sake, and you have not grown weary. And verse 6, you hate the deeds of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. Jesus begins simply by saying, I know. That is a comfort to the church at Ephesus. A fledgling body of believers in the midst of persecution and trouble. I know. Jesus knows what they have endured. He, he, he knows their heart level desires. He knows what they face. But this I know also brings conviction. Because Jesus knows. Jesus knows what's in their hearts. He says, I know your deeds, your life and conduct are in keeping with Christ's likeness. He says, I know your toil, that is, all-out effort to the point of wearied exhaustion. He says, I know your perseverance, that is, courageous acceptance of hardship and suffering and loss over time. And he says, I know your intolerance, and, and that's a good thing. You, you do not tolerate evil men. You have an ongoing inability to bear false teachers. And he says, I know your trouble. There, there was trouble outside the, from the seven sons of Sceva in the early days and Demetrius and an angry mob in Acts 19 to the temple of Artemis, the prominent feature of the culture of Ephesus, a, a rampant immorality in the culture surrounding them. Uh, he knew about the emperor cult and the, uh, the pressure that that put on the churches. If, if you didn't worship the emperor, you couldn't get your stamp of approval to go into the marketplace and freely buy goods and services. You could be excluded from the life of the city. Jesus knew the trouble from the Jews who persecuted the church. He knew the trouble from the Nicolaitans. And Jesus says in verse 6, you, you hate the deeds of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. They had brought their affections into conformity with Jesus' affections. It's not okay to love the things that Jesus hates. And they hated the deeds of the Nicolaitans. Who are these Nicolaitans? I believe these Nicolaitans get their name from Nicholas, one of the early disciples of Jesus, a man, in fact, who had been named one of the sort of proto-deacons in Acts chapter 6 who had worked to serve tables in, in Jerusalem. And from Nicholas, it is said that a group of disciples emerged who said, hey, you can follow Jesus and engage in the sexual immorality in Ephesus. It's okay to have your foot in the world and your foot in Christ. And, and the Nicolaitans were those who held on to that sort of immoral version of Christianity. Hey, you're forgiven, just do whatever you want. And Jesus says, I hate their deeds, and, and you're commended for hating them as well. Jesus knew about the trouble inside, the false apostles, those deluded, self-deceived deceivers, the ones who were not claiming to destroy Christianity, but offering a new version of it, corrupting it. They were posers and wolves and false teachers. The, the same ones Paul had warned about in Acts 20, 29. And Jesus knew of their endurance and perseverance, verse 3, for my name's sake. 
And it's a paradoxical commendation. You have toiled to the point of weariness, yet you are not weary for my name. The Ephesian church had practical holiness and theological discernment. They were uncomfortable with compromise. They suffered for the name of Jesus. They were exhausted in their loyalty to Christ, but they were not exhausted of their loyalty to Christ. They were mature, established, tested, a seasoned body of believers. And listen, we should take some cues here from Jesus' commendation. These are things to do that are right to do. How healthy would our church be if if we didn't sniff out wolves and run off false teachers and uh, do the things that Jesus commends them for. But that leads us to a confrontation. And that confrontation is here in verse four. But I have this against you, says Jesus. Stop right there. This is the serious part of the evaluation. Jesus, in and amongst his churches setting his gaze on one church and saying, I have something against you. This is the scary part of the audit. You have left your first love. And the word left here is the word for a sad departure, a defection. It's used for divorce or abandonment. What is this? First love. Stated generally here, he just says you've left your first love. Is this love for God? Is this a love for fellow believers? Is this a love for the lost? What does what does Jesus mean here? By first love, he he does not talk about the love of first priority. Literally, the original says the love which you had at the first. Your first love, the love you had in the honeymoon days of the church. It was in 1980 that Air Florida Flight 90 took off from Washington National on a blizzardy, snowy day. It had had its wings and engines de-iced, but then sat on the ramp for some time longer and collected more ice and was unable to get very far off the ground. It crashed onto the 7th Street Bridge and then into the icy Potomac River. Four people on the bridge and their vehicles were killed instantly and 74 people on board were killed as the plane plunged into the water. Priscilla Torado was one of the passengers and as she tread water in the icy Potomac River, she could not hold on to a rope that was given to her to pull her to shore. Her hands had become so numb and so cold she couldn't take the help that was offered. Lenny Skutnik was an assistant at the Congressional Budget Office on his way to work, driving in his pickup truck, saw the crash, threw off his work boots, and jumped into the river and pulled Priscilla Torado to shore, saved her life. Can you imagine Priscilla's thoughts and emotions as she thinks back to a sure demise and her rescuer? What does she think about Lenny Skudnik? Could she ever forget those moments? Could, could she ever get them out of her mind? But whatever else was true about Lenny, he had rescued her from death. Do you remember your first days after your rescue? From a fate far worse than a drowning death in an icy river in a plane crash. When you were rescued from the infinite wrath of Almighty God against your sin, do you remember the days you you first discovered that you were a sinner against a holy God? When you realized that, that your sin would be punished forever and ever and ever relentlessly and that you deserved it. And do you remember what it was like when you heard the good news, the gospel, that God sent his own son in the place of sinners to die a death on the cross, to die physically and simultaneously to endure the infinite wrath of God, which is eternal death, the second death, 
in the place of everyone who would believe, and, and you knew that Jesus was your only hope? And do you remember when you cast your life upon Jesus Christ and you said, I need Jesus. If, if I don't have Jesus, I don't have anything. And do you remember what it was like to fall in love with your rescuer? Can you, can you still smell the singed hairs on your arm from hellfire? Do, do you remember your rescue? Can you think back to what it was like to feel saved and to love your Savior? This is what Jesus is indicting the church at Ephesus for forgetting, for abandoning, for leaving, sadly. Their first love, the, the love they had at the first. And listen, you might be here this morning and have never experienced the love of God shed abroad in your heart through the gospel. Maybe you're catching a glimpse for the first time of, of your sin and your need of Savior. You need to understand that if you come to Jesus Christ today, you can have your sins forgiven. Past, present, future crimes against God eradicated totally and completely. You come to him and get washed in his blood, his death in your place to pay for your sins so that you Get God, reconciled to him, adopted by him, declared righteous by him, forgiven, created new, given new life, and life eternal. I believe that the love that Jesus has in mind here involves all of the above, love for God, love for fellow believers, and love for the lost. It all flows out of the first, our love for God, which really comes from God's love for us. What is the greatest commandment in all of Scripture? Love God. What is the second? Love others. Jesus himself said that he came to seek and to save that which was lost. And, and he rescues us unto that end. We, we love God because he first loved us. And we love others. And then we look out on a lost world. And we think about the Priscilla Torados, helpless, hopeless, surely dead, unless we throw off our work boots and jump into the river. If you love Jesus, you'll be drawn to love what he loves. Jesus loves his bride, the church. <laughs> to say that we love God but we don't love our brother is to be deceived about our love for God. And if you love Jesus, you'll be drawn to love your neighbor. Jesus taught us who our neighbor was in that parable of the Good Samaritan. Pretty much everybody. Love for the brethren, love for others. They flow out of love for Christ. If you notice your love for others waxing cold, it is an indication that your love for Christ has gone cold. For if you love Christ supremely, you'll love his bride. And if you love Christ supremely, you won't be able to help telling others about him. Do you think Priscilla Torado told others about Lenny Skutnik? Do you find yourself telling others about Jesus? What does Jesus say about the church at Ephesus? Their love had grown cold. The Ephesian church was guilty of doing lots of work on their lampstand without paying attention to the light for which the lampstand exists. Remember, the lampstand is the church in Revelation 1. And, and a lampstand, here, here's a, a technical Greek definition of a lampstand. It's a stand for a lamp. And the church as a lampstand exists to be the platform for a light. And the light is Jesus. How good is a lampstand with no lamp? You know, you've got a really nice lampstand there. You've been polishing that thing forever. Um, say, where's the lamp? A lampstand without a lamp is just a paperweight, a, a knick-knack collecting dust on the shelf. You see, doctrinal purity, theological fidelity, suffering under persecution, those things are supposed to be an effective platform for the light of Christ to shine. They themselves are not the light. Jesus is the light. Our love for him can grow dim while we're busy doing things for him. Practical holiness, theological discernment, intolerance for compromise, these things are not designed to be the fuel of a long-lasting church. 
They are indispensable for the church, but they're not the fuel. They're not the purpose. The fuel of the church is fervent, personal love for God through Jesus Christ. And that brings us to Jesus' command for the church at Ephesus. Verse 5. Therefore, remember from where you have fallen and repent and do the deeds you did at first or else I'm coming to you and remove your lampstand out of its place unless you repent. Jesus says, remember A present tense command. Keep on remembering from where you have fallen. That one's the perfect tense. You fell at some point in the past. You're continuing in this state of having fallen from your first love. Now, go on remembering from where you fell. And he says, repent. This is a a deliberate command, uh, commanding decisive change of attitude, resulting in a change of action. This command has urgency. And he says, return. Uh, Another command that carries this deliberate, urgent impulse. Return to the things that you used to do when love for me was at the center. The Ephesian church had allowed the fruits of love for Christ to replace love for Christ. Doctrinal fidelity, theological discernment, moral rectitude, uncompromising loyalty, These things all originated from love for Christ, but subtly, imperceptibly, they had replaced love for Christ. And the blazing center of the Christian life was set aside by the fruits of that blazing center. And I think it's easy to see how that could happen. A church is birthed in the gospel, and everything's new. These are the honeymoon days. Brand new believers who love Christ. And remember, the church at Ephesus burned their magic books in the city square. 50,000 days wages worth of repentance. (laughs) Visible before a watching world. We love Jesus, and we don't care what it costs us. Here's our old life. (laughs) Up in flames. They gladly faced rejection, persecution. Why? I love Jesus. If I have him, I have everything. Take everything away from me. I don't care. I love Jesus. But over time, persecution has an effect on the persecuted. You want to start to isolate yourselves from the persecuting world around you. You can become sort of a holy huddle and, and you can hunker down in a bunker mentality. Outside trouble produces isolation and protectionism. Listen, why do I want to go out on the streets and try to share the gospel with people when all they're going to do is persecute me? So I'm just going to stay inside. And of course, there's trouble inside. The false teachers were inside the church. Those pseudo-apostles were inside the church. And the, the Nicolaitans had infiltrated the church and... And that trouble inside breeds skepticism and suspicion. Believers can be looking over to their shoulder as heresy hunters looking for who's going to say the next wrong thing. Someone's going to teach something that's off theologically. And so we're worried about the outside, protecting ourselves from the outside, and, and we're suspicious on the inside. And it's not long until the church begins to pride itself in theological purity moral integrity, and its ability to discern error within and without. But the central thing, the thing that makes a church a church, the reason the lampstand exists, the fire, the light of Jesus, is no longer shining. And a generation has gone by since the book of Ephesians was penned, and the church at Ephesus is in danger of going out of existence. Oh, the machinery of the church is still operating, The doors are open on Sundays, sermons are preached, songs are sung, error is pointed out, sin is exposed, compromisers are run out of town. But the defining characteristic of a church, the defining characteristic of a Christian is gone. Love has left the building. And this is no mere trifle. This is a fatal flaw. Look at the warning of Jesus in verse 5. Or else, I am coming to you, and I will remove your lampstand out of its place unless you repent. This is not a reference to Jesus' final return. 
This is an immediate personal corrective to be made by Jesus with the church at Ephesus. You see, a church cannot survive merely on what it is against. A church cannot define itself merely by what it is against. The church must be characterized by, defined by, and driven by love. Love is to be the lifeblood of the church. And if it is not, then the church at Ephesus can no longer exist. You see, to be useful to Christ, you must be inflamed with love for Christ or you will be removed from usefulness as a lampstand. And so Jesus makes this plea in verse 7. He says, He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. If you have an ear, hear. This is a way to ask, are, are, are we on the same frequency? Are you a spiritual person? Are, are these spiritual words from Jesus resonating in your heart in whom the Holy Spirit dwells? Are you alive? If I'm broadcasting on an AM band, do you have it tuned into my frequency? Can you hear what I'm saying? This is similar to Jesus' statements throughout the Gospels. He who has an ear, let him hear. And Jesus would speak in parables where truth was concealed to the masses, but it was revealed to those who belong to him. This is an appeal to believers. It's designed to awaken the conscience of the faithful amidst the compromise of others. And each one of the letters has this appeal. In fact, this appeal goes beyond the church at Ephesus. Notice the way Jesus makes this appeal in verse 7. He who has an ear. So just this general statement, he, whoever, whoever out there has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches, plural. Do you hear that? It's not just whoever's at Ephesus who can hear what I'm saying to Ephesus, listen. But whoever has an ear. Let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamum, Thyatira, all of them. This is an immediate appeal for us to use all of these letters to address the condition of our own church, to address the conditions of our own hearts. And this appeal is followed by a promise in verse 7. To him who overcomes... I will grant to eat of the tree of life which is in the paradise of God. To him who overcomes, the the, the verb nekao, we get our brand Nike from this. It, It means to conquer, to win, to have victory, to overcome. What is an overcomer? What is a victor? Uh, The same author, John, in in his letter to, uh, in 1 John 5, defines for us what an overcomer is. Uh, Flip back a couple of pages to 1 John 5 and verse 4. Whatever is born of God overcomes the world. And this is the victory that has overcome our faith. Who is the one who overcomes the world but the one who believes that Jesus is the Son of God? Who is an overcomer? Not somebody who's exceptionally strong, exceptionally mature, exceptionally discerning, but a believer. A genuine believer in Jesus Christ is the overcomer, the one who has faith in the Son of God. And the promise of Jesus to believers is the promise of eternal life. Eternal life belongs to overcomers. Look at the way he says this, to him who overcomes, I will grant to eat of the tree of life which is in the paradise of God. To put it another way, genuine believers are those who overcome and inherit the promises of God. And the tree of life here is a significant statement. The the book of Revelation, the last book in your Bible, is sort of a bookend to God's self-disclosure. And the other bookend would be the first book, the book of Genesis. And so many of the things that show up in the book of Genesis also show up in the book of Revelation. The tree of life is one of those things. You remember the tree of life was the, that, that tree in the center of the garden that, that Adam and Eve in the garden were, were to eat from and enjoy uh, eternal existence in, in God's universe. 
After the fall, the, they were barred from the tree. Through the redemption which is in Christ, believers in Christ have access to eternal life. And, and this tree of life is an emblem of that living forever in God's presence where there is no more death, no more sorrow, no more pain. This is what is promised to those who overcome. Eternal life. I think there's another reason that Jesus brings up this tree of life. It's not merely a bookend to the book of Genesis. It's also a contrast to the temple worship at the temple of Diana. Remember inside the, the temple of Artemis, the temple of Diana, that wonder of the ancient world, in that asylum center was a tree. And it was actually called a tree of life. And it was a place where unrepentant criminals could go for asylum. They could be there and, and, and they could be safe. The tree of life promised by Jesus is way better than any asylum for unrepentant criminals. The eternal, pure paradise of God where no unclean thing exists. And yet, holiness in Jesus will be there. Believers in Jesus Christ, having been declared righteous and finally made holy, have a place in the outshining radiance of the holiness and purity of God that would destroy any unclean thing. And believers in Jesus Christ get to be safe there and actually enjoy it rather than being incinerated by it because they are clothed in the radiant beauty and excellency and glory of Jesus Christ's own righteousness. What a remarkable thing. It really is too good to be true. This is why Richard Baxter said in, in contemplating what it would like to be in heaven, uh, this thought would be there. How could a creature so vile as I inherit such rich treasure? How did the church at Ephesus respond to this evaluation, this letter from Jesus? Church history tells us that Ephesus repented collectively as a church and functioned as a witness to the love of Christ for at least another generation. That's good news. Today, modern Turkey is a secular Islamic state with very little witness for Christ. In other words, at some point, the lampstand was removed. That's been true throughout church history. Lampstands have come and gone. Churches have ceased to be effective platforms for the light of the gospel and the, the beauty of Christ before a watching world. How should we think about ourselves nearly 2,000 years later? As we think through Jesus' commendation and his confrontation of the church at Ephesus, we have to keep in mind that, that it's not okay to be content with doctrinal error. Right? We, we don't, from this confrontation, develop a definition of love that, that is the syrupy sentimentality that doesn't actually love people and lets in all kinds of toxic poison to betray and kill them. It's not okay to be content with doctrinal error. It's not okay to get comfortable with moral compromise. It's not okay to be naive about false teachers within the church. Listen, the church will be undone if the truth loses out to false teaching or if holiness is replaced by immorality. And you can read the other letters to the other churches to discover Jesus' attitude towards these things. But the message to the church at Ephesus is this. Doctrinal precision, moral rectitude, do not in themselves define a healthy church. We have to work hard to maintain the fire of love for Christ. At the heart level is each individual at Grace Bible Church and, and in all the ministries at Grace Bible Church. We must not let the machinery of doing church overrun the primacy of love. It's much easier for a church to do programs than to actually maintain at the spiritual level fervent love, love for Christ, love for each other, love for the lost. 
As a church, as individuals, we must continually cultivate warm, affectionate, deep, personal love for Jesus, who loved us and gave himself up for this. What would Jesus say about your own life? How are you doing cultivating love for him? Do you have things in your life that that help you remember your first love, that love you had at the first, the, the honeymoon days of your new life in Christ? Do you think about hell? Do you think about what you deserve? Do you think about what Christ has done? Do you have mechanisms in your own life to be around people who love Christ a lot? <laughs> the, the, the kind of contagious people that you just want to be around to, to help inflame your own love for Christ? And are you that kind of person in the lives of others? What would Jesus say about Grace Bible Church? That's an important question. Are we doing those things that are important to Jesus while neglecting Jesus himself? Or are the things we're doing the fruit of a pursuit and love for Christ? Joshua 23, 11 gives this warning. So take diligent heed to yourselves to love the Lord your God. It actually takes work, takes effort, diligence to take heed to our own hearts so that we love the Lord our God. Let's pray. Oh God, you have loved us with a love perhaps we will never comprehend. I pray that the eyes of our heart would be enlightened to know the heights and depths and lengths and and breadth of your love, which is beyond our ability to know. God, I pray that we would be eager to rehearse for ourselves the the very things that you have done to love sinners like us. That you saw us when we were weak, when we were hopeless and helpless and surely dead, when in fact in our hopeless, helpless, dead state, we were enemies of you, fighting against you, running away from you. And you and your kindness plucked us out of our rebellion, set us on your path, gave us new life and a new hope, new hearts, made us new people. God, may we never forget. May we never abandon this first love Would you, in fact, cause us to grow in our affections for you? And out of that, flowing out of that, our love for others and our love for the lost. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.